And this little audio is just about what if Darwin was right. I'm trying to cover all the bases, pro and con, the question, just so I can get it out there in case it's helpful to somebody. It's helpful to me to think out loud. I've asked myself this question a number of times and I do need to clear the air about what my objections are to Darwinian evolution and what they aren't. Let's pretend, for the sake of argument, that the neo-Darwin Darwinian position, because it's substantially different from Darwin's original thesis, let's pretend that the neo-Darwinian hypothesis that's being advanced by, you know, the atheists that subscribe to it. What if it were true? Number one, I would need to know why it works. Not because any position about God is threatened, because it's not, and I'll explain more about that in a minute. But it would be extremely curious to me if neo-Darwinian evolution actually worked because it's going against the laws of math, physics, genetics, and everything else that I've that I know. And I have a fair understanding of these things. So I would need to know how it is like for example Darwinian evolution violates set theory. Because the basic thing about Darwinian evolution would require a set to contain itself. Okay? Because, and well, even bigger than that, it would require that a set can actually birth a bigger containing set. That's even worse. In other words, if you had in set theory, you had a set that was 1 through 10. And we're talking closed sets here. Because genes are essentially closed sets. See, set theory and genetics are really two sides of a coin. Genes are just instruction sets. And they have a finite number of instructions in them about how to make whatever it is the gene is, you know, set up to make. So, if you have a finite number of attributes in a set, then they can only change within the boundaries of that set. In Darwinian evolution, it would completely upset, excuse the pun, set theory, because with Darwinian evolution, it's basically saying that set A, which is maybe, you know, like 1 through 10, can birth the number 11 to create a bigger set than itself. How is that possible? Basically, everything we know about math would be upended and reversed. So, too, everything about genetics. So, that would be my first question. If Darwinian, neo-Darwinian version of Darwin was true, then everything we know about math and genetics is basically upended, reversed. Therefore, we all have to go back to the drawing board about what we think life is. And if we have to go back to the drawing board about what we think life is, and since Neo-Darwinian theory is based on what we think life was beforehand, then everything about it has to be re-questioned also. Now, let's pretend somehow the answers to those questions were made available and they made sense. Okay. What problem is there if Neo-Darwinian version of the theory was true? Nothing. Because even the Neo-Darwinian version, which is basically saying that matter and energy exist and somehow magically combined, I have to use the word magic because there's no, no mechanism that makes any sense. There's no, no proof, no evidence, no, no nothing, not even a good theory about the change. Somehow matter and energy magically combine to what? Produce life? 
when life itself is neither matter nor energy? So it magically produced life, and then life magically produced from single cells and proteins and all this just magically came together into structures. Okay, pretend all that's true. And pretend the word magic is replaced by some kind of fakakta explanation that everybody buys. Okay. Still, what does that do? Nothing. Because the big question still remains, how did that process get started? Until you can account from start to finish you don't have anything but middle data that is inconclusive. It certainly wouldn't disprove God, especially because Genesis 124 is worded the way it is. All that would be, at best, neo-Darwinian, even if it was 100% proved fact. All that would do is tell me how God did it. It still wouldn't prove that there was no God, and it still wouldn't prove that God didn't do it. I type a key on my keyboard, and a whole bunch of instructions follow when I type that key. I could have programmed those instructions in advance, and then all I have to do is type the key, and all those instructions are put in motion. Well, God couldn't do that? See the problem? So Neo-Darwinian so-called theory, which is just completely indefensible from a mathematical, genetic, and physics, and scientific point of view on any count, even if it worked as so many want it to, it doesn't justify claiming that God doesn't exist. Because you still don't know how it got started. How did it get there? How did the matter and energy get there? How did the process get there? And of course, a lot of your landscape people and your steady state people and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, the universe was always there. Really? How can we have the law of entropy then? And they would respond by saying, well, it's cyclical. Because that's the current state of argumentation on landscape and steady state and all that that it's a cyclical okay then how did the cycle start see no matter what you say if you're talking about a universe that's expanding even if it's birthed by some other universe or multiverse or multiple dimensions of all these universes how did they all get there And if you just say the universe was always there, that's as much of a flying spaghetti monster as saying that God was always there. It never ends the question of how did it get there. You are forced to make a God-like premise one way or the other. Either the universe was always there, and what could be called God is this impersonal thing, which doesn't explain how personhood got here. I'm a person, I think. If a non-thinking universe birthed me, that doesn't make any sense. But if you want to say that, okay, fine, then we're ascribing a non-thinking universe that just was always there as the God. It's much easier and more logical to say that there was a personal God who did it. Neo-Darwinian evolution, even if it were true and didn't violate all the laws of math and physics and genetics, even if that were true, it still doesn't do anything to resolve the God question. It doesn't prove for it, and it doesn't prove against it. It's just middle data. Now... I need to explain more about why it violates these rules. I did that with respect to set theory. But if you don't really understand set theory, then that's not going to help you. Um, In set theory, I'll just close that part of it and then go on to another analogy. In set theory, you have open sets or closed sets. 
if you have an open set, then that means that there's that that there there's cap there's a cap a capacity of new data, constant capacity of new data, and that explains a whole lot more how things can mutate or be hybridized, etc. Um, but science basically contends the root how do you want to call it, the most important uh, principle in science is that there is never loss of information. All right? That's key to all science. I don't care what kind you're looking at. That everything is somehow ultimately a closed system. And that's the big problem that Stephen Hawking faced when he had to revise his own paper about black holes. Because the big the big conundrum to him was all these you know time everybody was saying, well black holes a closed system that you the information is not lost, it's somehow converted you know matter to energy energy to matter all being sucked down in a black hole and somehow emerging somewhere. Okay, well when he redid his calculations, I want to say it was in two thousand four, he found that there was some information lost and. The physicists who were listening to him just, they were in an uproar. And so he finally had to like backtrack and basically said, well, it doesn't really get lost, it's going into another dimension. And somehow, you know, when you take all the dimensions into consideration, then it's really not lost. Well, but that's not a terrifically satisfactory explanation because we can't prove the other dimensions. They're all theoretical. We can't prove that there are other dimensions. It makes sense to say it, and I kind of believe in it too, but you can't prove that they exist. All right? I'm an ardent sci-fi fanatic. I love sci-fi. I would love it if all these ideas that everybody's coming up with were true. I would love it if neo-Darwinianism was true, because it, you know, it's so cute. It's elegant. But nothing about it works. So if you don't understand the difference between open and closed sets to see the problem, then let me revert to another kind of explanation that might make a little more sense. Unfortunately today in schools, what's called evolution is a conflation. In other words, a, a, a combination of several different types of propagation which don't fit together, which contradict each other. And because they're all lumped under the title evolution, today's students, you know, this has basically been coming over the last 20 years, the students over the last 20 years really don't understand the difference between evolution in Darwin's terms and other forms of evolution and other forms of propagation. And this conflation has muddied the water so much that really science itself is in trouble. This is what bothers me the most. And since I started this audio by explaining, hi, if Darwin was right, it's no big deal. It would just mean that we'd have to like go back to the drawing board about what we think math is and what we think genetics are. Now, let me explain a little more about why that's true with respect to genetics. Because I already covered the math part. A gene is a set of instructions about how to make something. A gene combines with another gene, there's a split, and they recombine, and the result, the birthing, is some combination of the, the results of the split. In other words, the gene splits, and it get, basically gets joined to another gene, and then the, the amalgamated gene is supposed to be the product of, and generate the product of, two different genes. Okay? And it's not really just two, but pretend. Okay? Because I'm trying to keep this simple. The um, most common example to explain is like in meiosis and polar body, you have the splitting of the X chromosomes and the Y chromosomes, and they combine to form like a zygote. All right? And then after the zygote comes the embryo, la-di-la. -la. 
Okay, the combination, the birthing of whatever it is that comes out is coming out of a combination. And a mutation can occur at that moment of combination or shortly before or shortly after. Okay, even so, the totality of the instruction set in each of the genes that can combine successfully is limited. A really great example of this, if you want to go back to math, is fractals. Okay, there's a boundary. There's a, a boundary to the variables in fractals. And yeah, they can produce all kinds of shapes, but there is a certain commonality of those shapes, even so. Because a lot of scientists think that, you know, fractals explain an awful lot about shapes in nature. That's why it's relevant. So fractals help you understand the way genetics work. There is a boundary to how much change genes can go through. And they can go through cha change in three different ways. And unfortunately, the teaching of evolution doesn't sufficiently differentiate these ways. The first way is just simple propagation. Okay? So that the child is the product of his immediate parents. And then you have recessive genes versus dominant genes, and the child is going to still be a combination of the two. Strictly speaking, that's not considered mutation. Okay? That's just plain propagation. And, you know, this we've been doing that for years and years and years. Okay, you combine a red flower with a white flower, and the, the kids will be red, white, and some of them will be even pink. All right, and you can chart out the you know the genetic you know probabilities of that, the change. You know, Greg Ormendel did that. No, you know, even before him. Okay, that's the first kind, just plain propagation. We're not. It's not strictly speaking a mutation. Mutation, however, is something that can happen because something in the combining of the genes goes awry. And it can go awry because of some outside force impacting the genes when they're combining or just before they're combining or just after they're combining such that the child of the immediate parents is way different compared to the parents. And when I say way different, I mean it, it depends on the degree of mutation. But it is the gene itself is somehow its instructions are corrupted. And so what it tells the, you know, the instructions it sends to the proteins to make results in, in something that's so different that it, it doesn't have any resemblance to either of the parents. Okay? Some particular part of it. All right? That can be caused, one of the things that can cause this sort of thing that's really well documented is radiation. So if there are periods of, of abnormally high radiation at the time of the, the, the genes combining or before or after, then the, the child can be, as it were, um, very different. Now, very different to the extent that the child can no longer mate with normal, non-mutated other children, or when it mutates, the children of that second generation will be so different and yet still able to mate and then that mutation gets propagated alright so you've got plain propagation propagation with mutation involved in some degree and then evolution is simply the argument that a the mutation can be much larger than the genes can actually uphold and then it occurs in really small changes over a long period of time. And in Darwin's version, that there's always a selection whereby the kids are superior to the parents in some way. Superior in complexity, superior in ability, superior in survivability, etc. Okay, the evidence doesn't bear any of that out. In the first place, when genes mutate, there is a certain degradation in the instruction set itself. 
It's kind of like when you make a copy of something. If you were to take an original sheet of paper on which you hand wrote in, you know, ink, something. You place it on the copier. You copy it on the copier. And then you take that copy. And then you copy the copy rather than the original. And then you take the third copy and you copy that copy rather than the second copy. And so on down the line. By the time you get to the tenth copy being copied, in other words, successive iterations, not of the original, not of the second, not of the third, not of the fourth, but the second copy is copied to make a third copy, then the third copy is copied to make the fourth copy, the fourth copy is copied to make the fifth copy, and so on. By the time you get to the tenth copy, which is a copy of the ninth copy, there is a significant degradation that occurs. It might not be ten, maybe it's twenty. But the point is, it's very limited how many times the genes can corrupt and then be copied without the corruption of the entire instruction set actually being so bad that the gene itself is destroyed. That's the problem, the inherent problem with Darwinian version of evolution which relies excessively on mutation to establish some kind of sequence from a paramecium all the way up to human. Okay? Even if it's going through a tree, you know, a phyla, etc. Even going through a tree, you're still starting from some basic soup, some primordial soup that gave birth to the roots of the tree, that gave birth to the branches of the tree, that gave birth to all these, you know, things. The, the amount of mutation required is greater than the survivability of the gene at the base. Okay? It just can't replicate and change and replicate and change and replicate and change enough to produce extremely complex life forms like human from, say, paramecium or a bunch of proteins knocking around together in some primordial soup. It can't happen. Now, the same thing is true, again, in set theory. Because we're positing, and all science depends on this, a closed set where no information is lost that just cycles back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You got a closed set, honey. This thing isn't going to work. If you got genes that start out really simple, this isn't going to work. Now, a whole lot of scientists know that. So there are alternative evolution explanations that posit, well, rather than having some simple proteins knocking about in primordial ooze that somehow magically produce all these life forms in successive complexity, there was instead an initial population of a whole bunch of varied life forms, some of them complex, some of them simple. Okay, but then that's not evolution anymore, technically. That's hybridization. And that, again, goes back to set theory. If the set, the initial set, that births all the other sets is the largest set here of attributes of gene combinations. And it would have to be starting out as the largest set of all the possible combinations. Then everything coming out of it is just a child of it and you're just talking hybridization among the members of the set. So then that's not evolution. Even if you're talking about it taking place over thousands and billions of years, that's still not evolution, that's hybridization. So it's called evolution in school, but that's really the wrong name for it. It is a combination of hybridization and small, but never very long-lasting long mutations. So long as that initial set is big enough, then you could explain all life from it. But the initial set would be like Noah's Ark. Okay? 
it would be a version of the Noah's Ark explanation and there are branches of so-called evolutionary science that posit this initial huge enough population that all the rest of them could come from it and yeah that makes some sense but then you have to ask well how did that initial population get there so you see that still doesn't defeat the God argument you're still saying that the population was always there or God did it and God was always there you never you never get back to the beginning you can't solve for the impetus you always end up having to make a God statement either the universe is God and it was always there or there's a personal God and God the person was always there to make it all happen you, you just at the beginning you just can't argue anything else I mean maybe someday science can come up with something but how because everything is finite a finiteness can't always be there the only thing that's bigger than finite is infinite and infinite is not a regression or a progression like in math you have you know going all the way back in the negative numbers going all the way forward in the real numbers you just can't go you, you know that's just continuing infinity going onward that's not true infinity true infinity is a stasis always there and if it's a stasis it never changes it's the exact opposite of all the life processes that we know it's something that's always there that never changes closest analogy I can make to that that's not a God explanation is math laws somehow the laws of math have just always been there okay then how did they get there because math laws are a stasis they're always true we don't necessarily know all of what the math laws are but they're just always operating and they always operate on matter and energy all biology depends on it everything in biology basically can be reduced to a mathematical explanation we just haven't figured out what all of them are for everything in math there's some counterpart in biology and physics so you're still not solving the God question now one last thing I need to explain and so that you can see the difference between evolution and these other ideas that are called evolution but are not hybridization is not evolution simple propagation is not evolution I don't care over what period of time it occurs and mutation cannot survive long enough to become evolutionary the way Darwinian evolution tries to claim that the, the math just doesn't support it it can't work violate set theory okay because we're talking about closed sets because there's no loss of information that's primordial you know number one all science depends on saying that there's no loss of information that's like the prime directive of all scientific endeavor talk to any physicist you want talk to any biologist you want talk to anybody you want there's no information loss which means a closed system which means a closed set now if the closed set is the biggest set that there can be in itself is a stasis then it can give birth to processes okay but then what do you call that closed set more importantly if it's an open set then there can be inf new information but then where does the new information come from otherwise if it's a closed set then everything's just a combination of everything else and there is no new information you see the point Darwinian evolution requires new information from a closed set that can't happen and the gene cannot survive it mutation wise you can't explain it by mutation and Darwin is talking about it used to be called when I was going to school when we, Darwinian evolution was first taught he called it transmutation of the species the genes can't survive to the transmutation stage they can't there's no evidence that they can it's all conjecture so that's why Darwinian evolution is nothing better than a conjecture okay there's nothing to support it 
Now, one more thing about this that's conflated with Darwinian evolution and should not be is something that in science at least used to be called adaptation. Adaptation is not quite the same thing as mutation. Adaptation can be very simply done, and the body, even the human body, is very quickly um, capable of uh, adapting. Adaptation is basically you have your your biological form of some kind. Let's say human, because these will be real simple examples. You're human, and you live most of your life in Africa. You were born there, you live most of your life in Africa. As a result of that, your parents, your parents' parents, your parents' parents, parents' parents, also having lived there, will tend to have darker skin. That is an adaptation by your skin to your environment in order to block the sun. Melanin in particular will adapt that way. And over how many generations is that adaptation necessary for it to be effectual? Not very many. And this ends up being pretty quickly proven because if you, unlike your parents and your parents' parents and your parents' parents' parents, go move up to Chicago where it's cold all the time and the slant of the sun is different, over your lifetime, depending upon you know how quickly your melanin reacts, your skin will actually become paler, more pale, because it's not being exposed to the same amount of sun day in and day out as your parents and your parents' parents and your parents' parents' parents. The other thing that will happen to you if you like you know spent some years in Chicago, and I don't know how many years for me it was like twenty. Um, it might not have to be that long. The other thing that will happen to you, and this happens quite rapidly actually, within a year or two, your blood will thin out. If you're in a hot climate, and your blood will thicken if you're in a cold climate. I, you know, people even can comment about that. You know, if you've been living in, let's say, Chicago for years. You get used to the cold because your blood thickens and then you suddenly move down, say, to Houston and the heat is just much more unbearable because it, A, it never gets that hot in Chicago and B, it's, it's never uniformly that hot in Chicago. So it takes the body a year or two years maybe for the blood to thin out because the heat is much more prevalent, say, in Houston than Chicago. That's adaptation. And if you have kids having lived in, you know, Africa, but now living in Chicago for a number of years, that adaptation is passed on to your kids. And their blood will be thicker and their skin will be paler. It, I mean, it's not quite so simple a proof because it kind of depends on what kind of ancestors you, ha ancestors you had and whether they were, you know, from the northern parts of Africa or the equatorial parts of Africa, which are, you know, much hotter. But generally speaking, you'll notice that people who live in northern Africa have lighter, you know, brown skin than people who spent most of their lives in their parents' parents and their parents' parents in, say, Equatorial Guinea. So adaptation is not strictly speaking a mutation, but a change that you can go through and pass on to your kids. It's a kind of elasticity of your actual set of genes without mutation. There's a great deal of elasticity in the genes even without mutation occurring. Just simply based on whatever environment you're in. And a lot of what Darwin saw was adaptation. Okay. And he didn't know how to distinguish one from the other. So in class, when they were first teaching the difference between adaptation and evolution, they made you know serious distinction between the two. But over the years since I was in school in the 1950s, the two ideas have been conflated together 
adaptation being relatively rapid. And basically what, what they're trying to tell your kids in school now is, well, see, we know that adaptation occurs. Therefore, we posit that evolution occurs as, as, as a sort of grand adaptation. Yeah, but there's no evidence that it actually happens that way. And I feel really sorry for kids in school during the last 20 years because they're not sufficiently educated in the differences between adaptation and evolution and they don't understand this huge leap that leaps right over contrary evidence that claims, well, because adaptation happens, which isn't a, a small degree relative to evolution, that because the process of adaptation even occurs, therefore it must be true that over longer periods of time, this transmutation of the species occurs, which is Darwin's inherent and, and you know, central thesis. And so to the neo-Darwinians. You can't make that jump. That would be like saying, because fish exist, therefore man exists. Because fish have, generally speaking, you know, a two, uh, you know, a tail fin that's bifurcated, and two two fins on either side. Okay, you can't say that men come from fish because of that. All right. 